want to be empowered with the Holy Spirit? Are you in need of an uplifting message? It's time for today's Uplift, encouraging words and biblical truths to help you find freedom in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey guys, I got a message from uh, somebody who watches our show, and, and this is what it says. Here's something that I was just pondering as I was reading Hebrews chapter 12, verses 10 through 11. It basically talks about how our fathers disciplined us as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good so that we might share in his holiness. I started wondering how much of our lives are a result of God's discipline, and how does that, and what does that look like? How do we recognize it as such? And, you know, I've often wondered that too. I mean, not exactly the word for word as she put it, but how many of the things that we do as a result of whether it be discipline or just hearing God, and even if we don't realize we're hearing God, you know, so many people say, oh, I don't hear from God. Well, you have those gut feelings, you have those intuitions, you, and that's God speaking to you through your, the Spirit. How many times have we done things, or even just on a whim, done things, and it was God driving it? But yeah, how much of that correction and discipline has changed us, and how do we recognize it? Mm. I think my first reaction when I thought and read about this uh was that I believe that God rarely, if ever, disciplines us if we don't allow or ask him or invite him to. So, you know, that's the thing. And and I've been on this path for the past several months of, of asking him for discipline to correct some some wrongs that I've been living, wrong mindsets and wrong... Uh, you know, I've had hardnesses of heart in certain aspects and things and thoughts and feelings and um, life lifestyle that I had been living as far as, uh, I mean, I've shared before in my situation, uh, food addiction and, you know, especially that and gluttony and, and that sort of thing. And it, it, that I would fall short of defeating those problems if I did not ask God into my life for discipline because he was the only one that could bring the discipline that to to me that would be effective. You know, I think I think when I was looking over this, I th I think God disciplines everybody, but I think it looks different for believers mm -hmm. versus non-believers. And, and I think, I think what we see here, like in Hebrews 12, like we got to keep in mind, like it's written to Jews who have, who are trying not, some have received Christ, some have not. Right. And, and one of their big sins is not accepting the Messiah, right? Mm -hmm. Hebrews who aren't accepting the Messiah. So the whole book is written about how Jesus is greater than the Torah how he's greater than angels, how he's greater than the things they have experienced because he's the fulfillment of them. Hebrews 12, that's kind of what you see. It even starts off with talking about how Jesus is the author and, and perfecter of our faith. And what's nice about that, it uses that word perfecter because he's the writer is going to go into this topic of the father's discipline. And, I, and, you know, what father do you know waits for his children to ask him, right, to, to say, hey, dad, don't discipline me until you ask. <laughs> and that, yeah. that doesn't work that way, right? Like, so God disciplines, I think, either way. I think it just looks different. It depends on, it depends on what, where you're at in your walk. Yeah. And because, because he can't, because discipline, it's kind of like discipline looks different depending on the situation and the person. And so. So in this situation, they clearly are struggling with a with sin in their life. And when you see what's when you read through the chapter, and and I'll encourage our listeners to read through this chapter. It's it's awesome. It's powerful, right? And but when you read through this chapter, as it talks about Jesus being the perfecter of our faith, one of the ways He's perfecting our faith is discipline. 
God the Father disciplines his children. Well, the Hebrews were going through this thing, the believers here, right? The believers who are following Christ were going through this thing where they were sinning, and then they were, God was disciplining them for it, and they would fall away, saying, well, you just don't love us. So, like, they, they wanted this idea, they wanted this thing where God would accept their sin without any consequences here, without, you know, being the father. Well, God doesn't work that way. <laughs> and so, right. you know, he loves us too much to work that way. He's not going to leave us alone like that. Um, and so what happens is he, um, the writer then shows that discipline should be a reassurance. So, right, we're talking about uplift, right? So the writer here expresses that when you go through the suffering or the discipline that God puts in your life, that you need to understand it should be a reassurance for you because right. God only disciplines those whom he loves. And when he disciplines you, it's a reassurance that you really are his child and not illegitimate children somewhere that you really are his kid. Right. And so it's, so what the writer was trying to do is say, so lay aside your sin, you know, lay aside these things. And what you're going to find out is the discipline that God puts in your life is a reassurance of the fact that he really is your father. You really are his child. You know, I think one thing we need to remember here too, and, and that that's good what you said, but a lot of times we, we attribute attributes of our father's our earthly fathers or other people, we attribute that to God. So for some people, discipline can be seen as severe punishment. And that's not what this is. It's exactly what you say. It's a, and it's an assurance that God loves you because he's disciplining you. But we have to separate worldly, what we understand discipline to be in the world as to what it is with God. And, you know, and a lot of like what Chad was saying, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, Chad, is, you know, you want that correctiveness because you know who God is because of your relationship with God. You want that so that you can improve. But others may see it as, well, I'm getting stuck in the corner or I'm getting spanked or <laughs> and, and and that's not it, it, that's not God's discipline. God's <laughs> discipline is correction, set back on the right path. And, and you know, it's not. I'm not talking to you for three days. You know, it's mm. nothing like that. Right. Yeah. There's not the, yeah, you don't get time out. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. I guess God can do anything he wants, but. You sure, know, his, sure. He could. But, right. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I come at it from a, I guess my, my perspective of what, where I interpreted this or what I, what I got from when I prayed about this and, and sought the Lord was discipline as refinement because where and where my thinking in that was also as well was God brought to my mind. Uh, okay, there was there was a, a a guy I went to school with who died with a needle in his arm, and he did not. Let's say he at least did not accept God's discipline in his life because he battled drugs all of his life, mm -hmm. and. You know, outwardly, people thought, oh, he's a fun guy. You know, he was always a fun guy. He was always a class clown. And he was he was well liked in school by most people. But at the end of the day, he never accepted. Let's say he never accepted God's discipline, though God may have very well certainly have tried or offered him every opportunity. He never accepted it. And therefore, he died with that needle in his arm. And, you know, uh, there are Christians every day, believers, let's, let's go back to where Robert was with this. Believers, uh, God definitely puts, if you're a believer, okay, God definitely approaches each one of us and, and kind of certainly gives us nudges and elbows and winks and nods that, hey, you've got some junk in your trunk. <laughs> and I want to help you with yeah. that. 
and refine you and discipline you out of that, which we've talked about before. You know, Robert's talked about, you know, described when he first went away to college as a believer that God counseled him and peeled back the layers of his onion. Robert accepted the discipline and it was discipline, mm -hmm. right? You oh, know, yeah. so, yeah. okay. Robert accepted the discipline and the, ref I, I believe that the discipline is also refinement. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But yeah. some people certainly at the very least do not accept God's discipline. And, and there's, there's people, believers or not, who God may very, very probably likely almost always are going to, God's going to try to reach these people. Even if they don't have a relationship at all with him, they're, he's going to try to reach them. They're going to deny it. They're going to, they're going to turn him away. Mm -hmm. You oh, know, yeah. for yeah. various reasons too. And, and really it comes back to a relationship with mm -hmm. him. And a relationship is something that is cultivated that you, you know, I, people often use this verse, in my opinion, they take it completely out of context that when they try to use it to say, give me some money, they say those who sow sparingly, reap sparingly. I don't believe that's about money. I believe that's about your relationship. If mm -hmm. you put more into God, you're going to get more out of him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, with, with the relationship with God, if you sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. If you sow mightily, you're going to re reap a lot because he will provide. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so that is discipline. And and think about this. Uh, think about this. Um, and I, I just I want to mention a couple of scriptures because when you said refiners fire, yeah, there's there's a lot of scriptures about refiners fire. God actually refers to himself as the refiner right at, at some point so in malachi 3 he says but who can endure the day of of his coming who can stand when he appears right so the quite there's some questions here right who's going to be able to stand when the lord appears well what's the answer well he says for for he will be like a refiner's fire of launderer's soap he will um sit as a refiner and purify uh, a purifier of silver he will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Now, if you, it, what's really cool about this, when you talk about refining precious, notice it's a refining of precious metals, right? Mm -hmm. So God is using himself as an analogy that he's the refiner, you're the precious metal. Well, precious metals have impurities in them. So you have to refine them, right? To, mm -hmm. So that the shine comes out, right? Well, so God is saying, well, who can stand? Well, he has to refine us, mm -hmm. right? And so in refining, so it's this discipline process to take out impurities. And if you, if you study like uh, how a refiner of precious metal, it's just amazing. I would encourage people to do this too. This is powerful. But I remember a gentleman was talking to how he was watching this guy refined silver or gold i can't remember which one i thought i thought it was um silver he was doing and he was refining this and it's like a point in your refining that you leave it in the fire and if you leave it too long it destroys it but there's a moment that you leave it in there just right it takes out all the impurities mm -hmm. so god leaves us in the fire just long enough to take out the impurities he wants to take out of our lives, that we would be able to stand with him, that we would be able to be with him. And if you ask, if you ask the silversmith or the goldsmith, you say, hey, how do you know when that moment is? How do you know? Like, that was what the person was asking. I read this a while back, and he said, how do you know when the moment is that the metal is refined? And, the, and it was amazing what the person said. They said that the gold or silversmith said, well, when I see my reflection in it, oh wow, that's how I know it's refined. Oh, that's cool. That is cool. So you see what God is expressing there in the scripture. So He's going to refine us. He's going to discipline us so that He sees His reflection in us. Mm. Mm -hmm. Boom! Boom! Yeah. Right? Isn't that cool? <laughs> right. So who can stand? Who can be here when the Lord comes? Who can? It? Well, God will refine us.
Yeah. And, and when, when he sees his reflection in us, you get to come out of the fire. All right. Your impurities will be gone. And actually, if you keep reading through Hebrews 12, going back to it, that's what he, it, he says, why God disciplines us that we would be made righteous, like right. that we would have this come through. So just powerful. I'm sure we can all look back on our lives and see those moments where we of intense struggle, but it was God that allowed that time, at least for me in my life, I, I know this a couple of times, he allowed it because I was, I had the wrong idea about him. But when I came out on the other side of that, I had a greater understanding of who he is because I went through this three and a half year trial or whatever it may be. So yeah, it's, uh, you're right. The right moment, he pulled me out of the fire at the right moment. Now, you know, I think people think because we're like ministers or pastors or, you know, that I think people sometimes think they can't do something like, oh, I can't be what you are. Or I can't yeah. be where you are. Or, I can't be that. I see these super Christians or whatever. There's no such thing as a super Christian. Hmm. Right. The reality is there there's there's Christians who have gone through fire and there's Christians who are refined and there's Christians who are re being refined and. You know, we're all right, at different right. stages of God's pure, you know, puri purification process, right? And so you, we're all kind of displaced, but discipline is required. But like, if I could just encourage people, here's what I would say about this. I'm a pastor of a church and God came to me over a three week period. And I think, Chad, I told you about this, I think, where God was just disciplining me over one subject after the next for about three weeks. Mm. and it was rough like it was like i was wondering if god was going to say anything good to me <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> but it was like the first thing god i mean and this is a period of three weeks. so what, what i'm trying to i want to encourage people with it i'm not trying to discourage you because it was what i needed mm -hmm. like I, I was not walking correctly and i needed this from god i needed to see this and um so god told me the first week that of this process he just came and, you know, cause I'm like crying out to the Lord and the Lord comes to me. And he said, he's like, uh, you are Saul. Mm. And I said, and he wasn't talking about Saul who was converted in Acts nine. He was talking right. about he's being Saul. King. Right. Yeah. And he said, you're Saul. And, and he, he pointed a scripture to me. If you pay attention to why Saul died, Saul died because of his disobedience to the Lord. It says it very clearly in scripture. Saul did not die because the army was overtaking him. He did not right. die because, you know, he, it says he died because of his disobedience. Mm -hmm. And what God was showing me was, he said, you're Saul because I give you stuff to do and you're disobedient. Mm -hmm. And I went, oh, that was, that was rough. So I repented, you know, I'm thinking, okay, Lord, we're good, right? Everything's good. And the next week, he, uh, I hear the Lord again. He's like, you're Nicodemus. Mm. And I went, okay. And he said, you know, everything there is to know about the Bible, but you don't know anything about my spirit. And I went, oh, you know, that was another blow, right? Like, as, and, and, and God wasn't wrong. Like he was reading my mail, right? He's like reading these things. And, and he was right. And I was repenting over that because I, I spend so much time. It's I, I was getting to a place where I felt like if I knew God's word, then that was salvation. Mm. If I knew, if I just had enough, mm. right. If I just knew enough and, and God was like, no, it's, it's, you, it's my spirit that you need. See, Nicodemus knew everything about the word and was missing the Messiah standing right in front of him because he didn't understand the spirit of God. And then the third, the third week was powerful and God, told me this he said that you have spent your life learning the world's ways but you do not know my ways mm. and and i repented over that and i started reading how jesus is the way and i started reading how god has a way about him that the world doesn't understand right and uh and so you know but this was a even as a believer, right, who has been walking with the Lord for a while, this was a three-week discipline process. Mm. Like, God was not okay with where I was at, and he was like, these are your problems right here. Mm. You know, you, you said you were reading 
about it. And that part of this question that she had was, how do you recognize that you're changing if because of God's discipline? And one of the ways is when you, if you do turn to the Bible, he's going to lead you to the things that are going to show you the correction, that are going to show you where you were wrong, that are going to teach you. And so he, you know, his spirit works with his word and your relationship to fully right. skim that dross off of the fire all the impurities so yeah that's that's really good good testimony there was a there was another one i just finished a book uh by a, a lady named Teresa hotelling and uh it's called uh the unhealed believer and it's an incredible book and even even if you don't have you know physical ailments you could apply it to anything in your life so if you need healing from emotional or mental uh things whatever you could you could definitely uh, it's an awesome book but she told this story and it's a long story that you know she she told about how god refined her in to heal her from her physical diseases but the actual healing had nothing to do with her physical diseases that wasn't the point the point was mm -hmm. he was refining her mindsets and her heart and all that sort of thing. Well, anyway, he, God walked her through this and she sought him and walked her through this discipline and, and this refinement and everything. And, and, and God healed her from uh, diseases that, you know, of course, doctors cannot heal you from in this, in, in you know, medicine. So she got, she received divine healing. And then several months later she started to develop issues again health issues again and she sought the lord and the lord said you're you're not eating the way i want you to eat you're eating junk food and things and you're not you're not um being a good steward of your of the temple that i gave you and she was like oh that can't be you healed me like you, you know so she was disobedient to god and God let her go, and, and things were getting a little worse, and she cried out to God and said, God, you know, you, you healed me, but I'm starting to feel sick again. And he said, I told you what to do. You did. You were disobedient towards me, and now you're going to have to, to uh, you're going to have to do a 21-day eating plan for me to, for, for your body to, to overcome this thing that you've done she did that and within three days everything was back to normal yeah. but she fall she was obedient and followed the you know god basically said you have to in order for this for for you to defeat this you're now you've got to go 21 days now yeah and, and it was a matter of her disobedience and so god had to you know but it was her choice mm-hmm she made the choice to be disobedient, not listen to God, and therefore it was more painful for her. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, that's kind of the way. I mean, that's the isn't that the way it is with think about like our earthly dads or moms, and they warn us about something, mm -hmm. and then we don't listen and we <laughs> suffer the consequences of it, right? Like we, yeah. we've all been there, right? Yeah. Like I don't, I haven't met a perfect child yet. Um, <laughs> It would have been neat to meet Jesus as a kid because oh, yeah. I've never seen a perfect child. That would have yeah. been the only time I could have ever seen one, right? Yeah. And so, like, it would have been great. But, um, but yeah, like, there's this, there's this consequence to the actions that we have, and a lot of it is God warns us, and but we do to God like we do to our parents, and we we either don't believe them, or we do it anyway. Mm -hmm. all right and i'm, I'm gonna have a sermon one day called the anyway christian right? like, <laughs> we we do it anyway right yep and uh and that's kind of that in in that sense like i think we always think in our culture discipline bad mm -hmm. right but can you think i mean can you think of any good organization or good parenting or good thing that happens that doesn't happen without discipline right all right like <laughs> discipline is a great thing we yeah. just consider it bad because we don't like we don't like going through it right so like what happens is and and that's 
taking us back to Hebrews, right? The Hebrew writer actually says, we don't like discipline in the moment, all right? But we endure the discipline right. because of the result, right? And that's kind of like, we see that in our society, right? Like, hey, you know, I'm sure a lot of athletes who are professional now did not like the discipline they mm -hmm. had to put themselves through. But I bet they liked the results, right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, and it works that way in our life. I may not like the discipline of memorizing scripture or reading my Bible or praying, but I'm going to love the results. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it's, it's the results that we got to realize that are coming from that discipline. So God is perfectly okay with disciplining us because he understands the value of discipline in our life how important that is all right and and you know the one thing about it is is you know we we were born into sin because of what adam and eve did and jesus atoned for that but when we don't live by you know the, the what jesus instructed us to live okay then we're not under in 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 those instances that's where we need the refinement because Jesus, Jesus took and, and did all the refinement for us. But if we don't choose to live under that, that's where God, we have to rely on God because we're, we're, we're out there in the wilderness in, in that Adam and Eve sin. We're not under that, dare I call it umbrella of what Jesus atoned us for. And, and, and that's really something that, uh, I, <clears throat> that I think about a lot. Oh yeah, and you know it's uh, I, I I wanted to kind of bring up one more thing as we keep reading through this chapter. They give an example. Did you guys read through uh, chapter twelve and see the example that was given of lack of discipline or lack of allowing God's discipline? It was Esau. And I think to myself, oh. when I read that, I was like, okay, well, yeah. Esau is not one of those characters in the Bible that I really care to read about too much. But, yeah. but I was like, all of a sudden, it piqued my interest. And I was like, whoa, why would they bring up Esau in this? And he literally brought up the fact in the scripture, they're going back and connecting this saying, so you, and you kind of think about the chapter, hey, lay aside the sin that's causing the discipline in your life, because you know then you'll be able to follow God. He's going to get you back on the right path. And Esau, they bring up the fact that, of course, Esau is famous for having sold his birthright for a bowl of beans, right? And, you know, he the point of Esau that they give is that he was willing to trade. Now, you got to understand his birthright was represented. He was the firstborn. So the birthright, it would have included Messiah. Mm -hmm. So he was willing to trade off Jesus for beans right willing to trade off jesus for a momentary satisfaction mm -hmm. i've done that oh who hasn't yeah I, yep. I mean we, we you know why the writer of of hebrews gives us esau because we have all done that we've all <laughs> had our bowl of beans right there yep. and Absolutely. and but but we need the discipline right we need god at that point i mean think about if our whole what if you did that with your whole life Hey, can I have you guys? Can I have your 401ks? I got a bowl of beans here. Hold on, I'll get it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> would, would anybody do that? Like, is that, uh, you know? I don't know about Phil, but that's about what mine's worth. Uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, not, not, that's not far from an even trade on mine. Oh, mine's right, got a big yeah. hole in the in the bowl. <laughs> yeah. I mean, nobody, nobody sees that as wisdom, right? We all would be like, oh, but Jesus is worth far more. Yep far more than what we own right far right. more right and esau was willing to trade that and so we he, i think what he's warning you to know, don't trade away jesus for your momentary pleasures because if you do discipline's going to happen and then if you refuse the discipline now let's think about this if g if if the lord disciplines his children what are you saying if you refuse god's discipline Mm. you're saying you are rejecting him as a father that you are not going to be his child 
All right. And so that's a terrible place to be. So God desires that we would walk correctly with him. So he will discipline as a way of uplifting us that we don't go yeah. down that road. You know, that we don't trade our 401k for, you know, lentil soup. You know, like, <laughs> well, lentil soup is good. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Hey Phil, I got a I got a deal for you, man. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I want to give an example of how I didn't recognize it as discipline, but it was, and it and it paid off. Like you said, you know, I like the athlete didn't really like the discipline, but it paid off. Um, twenty some years ago, I first read the Bible all the way through. And I loved it so much. I did it again. Like I took maybe a month off and did it again. And then I didn't for a long time, like several years. And then I started, but I never finished. And it was a long time. And I kept hearing God say, you should read the Bible. You should read the Bible. Well, it was more than just read the Bible. It was, he led me to a plan on the, the Bible app on that you can download the U version Bible app. Ninety days, like what? I can't do that. But I knew he was leading me to do it. Ninety days. It was aggressive, very aggressive. So I did it. And about halfway through, I wanted to just read ahead. And he's like, "No, read each day as prescribed." And I did that for ninety days. You get two days off. In after thirty days, you get a day off. After sixty days, you get a day off. So I did it and okay, great. You know, I read the Bible again. And then the following year on the same day, start the 90 day plan again. I'm like what? That was hard, Lord. I did it. And I stuck to it, right? Finished it in 90 days. But then I realized how much I really learned by reading the Bible that quickly. And I comprehended and it, it was, you know, I don't know how many times I had read it to that point, but it really changed. And it was at the point also where I was changing in my life and a lot of things were changing in my life and it just all played in together. And here, it, what, what I realized afterwards was the, that the Lord was disciplining me because I had not read the Bible all the way through. I, I mean, I would read it, but not all the way through. Yeah. And he wanted me to do that. And even in years past, he wanted me to do it. And I was just, yeah, okay. I, like that one time I started and didn't finish. So it was, it was hard. It was very aggressive, but I can't wait to do it again mm -hmm. when he leads me to do it again. And since then I've um, read it again all the way through. It took six months this time, but instead of 90 days, but I'm ready to do it again because it just learned so much. So. And, think, and think of all the people that have been blessed by you doing that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sure. Uh, probably better sermons and better conversations with people as a result. And, um, yeah. And so praise God for the discipline. Absolutely, yes. Now, I'm well, not like, saying that's it's not something that everybody should do. That's just, that was me. You know, mm -hmm. that's where I was in my relationship with him. Mm -hmm. To do that, it could be completely different for somebody else. And we just have to push into God, like like Chad was saying, you know, where do I need to change, Lord? And then be willing to make the change. So don't be like Esau, right. and who then wanted his birthright back, but couldn't get it. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And that's exactly what it talks about, right? Like yeah. He, yeah. He, like he prayed and cried and yeah. it was gone, right? Um, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. And yeah, that's right. Uh, that was a good thought, like thinking about what it, I, I was kind of goofy, but I was thinking about what onion layer are you on? Yeah. Right? That's going to depend on the yeah. discipline you receive, right? Like, right. What right. onion layer has God peeled down to in your life? And that's going to, and then he's going to give you a discipline, right? Like, what is the thing that you should be doing? Or... Well, you know, and, that, and that's, a, that's a great point because uh, there's no prescription or formula for anything in, in when you're walking with the Lord and anything in Christianity and our beliefs and, right. and, and God, it's all individual. 
you know, the one thing I've read so many books and I've listened to to hundreds and thousands of hours of of teaching from pastors and ministers and testimonies of people and everything about healing and deliverance. And the one consistent thing that I found is there's nothing consistent. The one thing, the one thing is individual relationship with God. That yeah. is the the only thing because what he would if all three of us and everybody listening had the same exact problem, okay? Let's let's say it's finances. Let's say okay. uh you know, we're let's say we all lost our job all on the same day and we were underwater basket weavers. And there's 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 no need or call for underwater basket weavers, but we all lost our job today. And we all sought the Lord and said, God help me. Uh I, you know, I, I lost my job and I'm an underwater basket weaver, and there's not a single job opening anywhere. Okay. The what he would guide each one of us to do would be completely different. Oh, yeah. He'd tell Phil, Phil, you go do this, Robert you go do this, Chad, you do this, you know, and, yep. and that's the thing. There's no prescription. There's no magic. There's no magic about this. All it's with the same intent of seeing his reflection. Yes. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. Yeah. That's right. Like it, that's what it would look like. Yeah. Because, mm -hmm. and it's interesting because you, you can see that through the scripture, what you were saying, like, think about how Jesus would heal people. Like how many blind people did Jesus heal? Yep. How many blind people did he heal the exact same way? Right. Yeah. Right. Like this is a, how many demons did he cast out? How many demons did he cast out the exact same way? Mm -mm. None. Right. Like it's like because and and I think I just think it's the dynamic. Okay. It's kind of like this. If when I study the Greek language, Koine Greek, for the what the Bible was the New Testament was written in. It's a dead language. So currently its rules don't change. Mm -hmm. So things that are dead, rules don't change, nothing to it, right? Wherever it's at, that's where it's at. But a living language has exceptions. Mm -hmm. and it's dynamic. It's changing and moving, right? And it's it changes into another language, right? And relationships are that way. So our relationship with the Lord because God is living and not dead, hmm. and we are living, the relationship is dynamic. Now, not his character, not his, you know, not who he is of himself. He's not going to change, but how he may move us in our life to get from point A to point B all of us can rest assured it's going to be in line with scripture. It's going to be led by the Holy Spirit, but may be different at what our life looks like. But it's still going to get us to see the reflection of God in our life. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be powerful and awesome, but it's, it's like catered, right? It's catered to that relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing. Well, I hope we answered the question for the viewer. Um, hope it was uplifting, but uh, we're coming close to the time where we need to cut it out. But um, great conversation tonight, guys. I thought this was really good. Yeah, the, the one encouraging thing there in Hebrews that, 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 that they asked about, one last comment that I had was harvest of righteousness. Mm -hmm. There was a, a harvest right. that comes from it. Mm -hmm. absolutely. absolutely don't think of god as disciplining with no reason right like it's right has a great purpose a beautiful thing to it right like god is trying to lift you up yeah imagine yourself being a farmer and, and you're having problems growing your crop and who do you call you call the extension office <laughs> yeah. they're they're going to discipline <laughs> they're going to discipline you well god you know this is about harvest with the lord and if you're, if you're having trouble growing your crop Call for help. Hmm. That's good, Chad. I like that. Mm -hmm. That's good. All right. Well, any final thoughts, guys? 
I used mine up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that was I think that was a good thought. I think it's uh don't be scared of God's discipline. Yeah. It's a right. good thing. Especially if you want the harvest, right? The right harvest. Yep. Right. Exactly. All right, guys. Well, um, we will be back again next week. I believe. I don't think uh any of us are not gonna be here. As long as you're not going to the beach again. No, I'm not going to the beach. You're not going to feed any seagulls. <laughs> Robert and I are boring. Robert and I are always here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I live close to the beach. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun. It was good to get away. Uh, it was refreshing, but I'm glad to be back too. And glad to be back with you guys too. Uh, even though we had a nice week off. Mm -hmm. so. Yep. All right. Well, we'll see everybody again next week. Yep. Good night. Yep.